Hello and welcome to Festival Ideas Online. I'm Zoe Stedman Milne, producer of the festival, and today we're going to talk about how we seek to make sense of death and can art help us understand and find some sort of peace. I'm joined by Arifa Akbar to discuss her memoir Consumed, A Sister's Story. Uh, here's the lovely, beautiful book. It's a compelling and searingly honest book about loss and grief, sisterhood, family and belonging, all woven together with art history and a medical mystery at sort of the centre of it. Arifa is The Guardian's chief theatre critic. Uh, she's been a journalist for over 20 years and is the former literary editor of The Independent, where she also worked as an arts correspondent and news reporter. She's previously contributed to The Observer and the Financial Times. She's on the board of trustees of the Orwell Foundation and English Pen. Short pieces of her non-fiction have appeared in several anthologies, but Consumed is her first full-length book. Arifa, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. That was such a succinct uh, summary of the book. Yeah, well, that was good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, shall we start with your yeah. reasons for writing the book and for writing this book now? Um, I was sort of thinking as I was reading it as a former literary editor and of course a critic, books, reading, writing, it's, it's, your, it's your job already. Um, but writing a memoir is a very, it's a very unique undertaking because you're sort of willingly exposing your, but also in, the, in this case, your family and your sisters to the, to the general public. And, you know, readers, as we know, will impose their own sort of interpretations onto what you're giving them. So can you talk a little bit about your decisions to do this? Yeah, yeah, you're so right in saying that it ex it, it's very exposing, the memoir is exposing, and it has to be. Uh, for my sister's story to make sense, I had to go there with the family story and all the dynamics between siblings and my mother and father's unhappy marriage, and I had to go there in order to to tell my sister's story. The reason, the, the, the reason I felt that I had to record it, write it down, make sense of it on paper and have it published you know um is that is is the medical mystery and the horror around her lack of diagnosis because she was in hospital she was shuttling in and out as you you know as you know because you've read the book she was shuttling in and out for um well she'd been complaining about you know her health for months but she'd been in a and e for weeks in and out and the doctor she had a large team of doctors couldn't find a reason for her illness and she had a massive brain hemorrhage, which was fatal. But even as we collected around her bed, we were told this, this illness doesn't really have a name. We, know, we, we really can't name what, what has caused this, you know, the underlying thing, we can't name it and we, you may not get a name. Mm -hmm. And it was only when one doctor thought to retest something of hers and had the idea that it could be TB, that she was diagnosed with TB after she'd had a fatal hemorrhage. And that shocked me, the horror of that, that unknowing that she died without naming, without a name to her illness, that we, we were in that state collecting around her, not knowing the name of what was killing her and what had killed her. And, and actually the, the shock of knowing that it was TB. Um, and I didn't, maybe I'm naive, but I did think that it was an illness that was, had been there, you know, roaring in the 19th, up to the 19th century, that had, it had sort of died away, but it hasn't. Mm -hmm. It's a pandemic, it's classed as a pandem pandemic, but it's pushed out of our line of vision in, in certain countries in the West, but it's there and it's massive and it can kill, particularly in the West, it shouldn't, but if it's not diagnosed, it's gonna kill you. And it, and it was for those reasons, the medical element of it, the shock and horror and, and some of the ways in which I felt the medical case was handled, you know, I felt really poorly and we as a family were left with so little comfort and, and proper explanation from the hospital that I felt there was a need to, 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 to speak about this, to write about this. And, and the further I got in, the more removed I became from the medical side and I became immersed in other elements too. And that's really interesting because, of course, you do approach it um, through the sort of the prism, essentially, of, of your work, of art. Um, and so, sort of one of the first things, you, the sort of places you take us is this sort of idea of, of TB is this sort of mysterious, this sort of, you know, this er, it, sort of an, in, um, an illness from a bygone era and this sort of romanticised sort of aspect of it. Do you want to look up to, and of course, there's the, the amazing sort of the Keats connection, which then you keep stumbling across is yeah. sort of so close in terms of actual land proximity to you and to your sister so do you want to talk a little bit about that 
Yeah, like when I first set about writing this, I knew that I didn't just want to write a memoir, a, a grief memoir. The reason why I didn't, because I've read so many amazing books, as you know, um, yeah. you know, just said I'm a literary editor and, and, and I read, you know, amazing books all the time. And among them have been some astonishing sort of grief memoirs that really mine uh, the, the, the grief and the mourning and, and come out with these, this great wisdom. I knew I couldn't mine my grief. There was, no, there was little wisdom there in itself. So I knew I wanted to do something bigger. I knew it was, had, had a medical elements and the bigger story of TB actually. I was fascinated because I had been so ignorant about it. And I thought this, this could be about my sister's death, but also the bigger, the bigger um, story of TB. Um, and then it, it grew from there. And I think it stemmed out of my sister and I as teenagers had uh, really connected um, through books and through films, her love of visual arts. She'd sort of, she was my older sister and she taught me a lot. She led me a lot. And we had great passions together about the arts. And, you know, the arts is not an elite thing. We grew up, you know, with hardly any money and, and very little resource. Um, and yet, culture and books and films and telly and talking about ideas became incredibly important for us and it was the way we connected as sisters in a lot of ways and the way we saw ourselves as sisters the way we explained ourselves to each other and the way we saw the world so it struck me that and you know now I'm in a in a job that's all about that yeah. seeing the world through theatre you know before seeing the world through books and it sort of made sense I, I've I found myself doing it without actually realizing. As you say, there's, I decided not just to think of TB in, it, in terms of its medical history of, of, as a disease, as, as this massive infectious disease killer, uh, but this sort of mythology and, and romanticized, romanticized mythology actually around the illness, because the more you read, I mean, you don't have to go far. I knew just because from my book's background that there were a million artists and writers that had um, died, had lived with and died of TB from the Brontes to Keats, as you say, yeah. to Thomas Mann. I mean, so, there's so many there. I, you know, I could spend ages naming them. So there was that. And as well as sort of, theories around how it was romanticized. Suzanne Sontag talks about it a lot, but so do others. You know, how there's an aesthetic in the 19th century, there was this beauty aesthetic around yeah. TB and people tried to acquire the TB look who, who weren't suffering from it, this pale, frail look. And that chimed with my sister because she had an eating disorder for, for a large part of her life. So suddenly I saw these synergies and these kind of uh, interfaces between my themes and then you know all of a sudden I had this sort of Keats connection that I as you say stumbled across because um, as a family we we also shuttled between London and, and Lahore in Pakistan which is where my parents are from for some part of my childhood you know I was born here but we went back to and fro quite a while and we ended up returning to London from Lahore um, homeless um, and the first awful home we lived in surreptitiously was a squat you know was a was a a, a dilapidated built then dilapidated it's been rebuilt building in at the top of Hampstead which is ever so wealthy and well healed it was then and still is now um uh, it's surrounded by wealth but we we were stealthily living in this one room this appalling room with no sort of clean water and heating or whatever uh, and soggy walls uh, for the first sort of months of, of our time in London we, we all lived there as a family in this terrible one room and I went to visit that one room because I was tracing my sister's beginnings and our beginnings as a family and then I realized that 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 spot our first home was a 10 minute walk from where Keats had lived and where he had got TB and where he'd still hoped that he would carry on living. You know, it's where he'd met Fanny Braun, his fiance. And, and he'd, so, so he'd lived, you know, not far from us, suffering from T, TB over a century earlier. Mm. 
and I began reading his letters. I took a journey to Rome, which is where he, he went because he was deaf, you know, he was, he, he'd started, he'd written his poetry, he had so much to live for. He was in this fever of producing his poetry, a bit like my sister before she died, she was in a fever of producing artwork because she, after decades of depression, she'd gone back to her art and she couldn't stop producing. It was amazing, the artwork. So um, Keats was in that, in that sort of, just wanted desperately to live and not to die of his TB and he'd gone to Rome in hope to have a different climate and to, and to recover. And I went to his room, the room in Rome where he died. I went to visit his, the cemetery where his headstone is. It was one of the journeys I took um, and while I was there in Rome, I remembered actually my sister, when she was, had her first big bout of illness, went to the Sistine Chapel in Rome at the age of 19. And I thought, well, let me, let me go there and let me see what she saw in there. And, and I went and it was absolutely, it was, a, it was a really key moment. And it becomes, I think, a key moment of the book when I begin to see things differently. So all of this, these journeys, I take much more, many more journeys to, to Tuscany and to Norway. Um, they, they sort of uh, were organic. You know, I didn't plot it out and thought, right, I'm gonna write a book about art history and Keats. It, there were proximities, as you said at the start, that, that emerged as I started to think about what my sister meant to me and who we were as sisters. And I took it from there and I went on all these sort of trips. And it's quite astounding because it's by no means a long book, but you pack so much into it. And you know, like you described there some of these amazing trips that you take to sort of follow not only her sort of story, but also the, the, the sort of the art story that you could sort of interweaving. Um, and I, yeah, I was quite astounded by how it reminded me of sort of that sort of paring down of story that you've done really beautifully in this book, actually. And you've, you've managed to pare it down and down and down, but at the same time, pack each page full of so much. And it's quite, it's, again, it's quite a skill. And I wondered again whether, whether that was sort of a conscious sort of, a, again, coming from a background where writing and reading is your, is your work, were you very conscious about, you know, I don't want to make this into this mammoth big beast of a book. You know, I really, uh, how, how much editing were you doing, I suppose, is my real question. That's such, a, that's such a good question because I wasn't conscious of a pared down style. People have now, since I've written it, told me, oh, it's very pared down. Yeah, it's really sort of oh. succinct, yeah. And, and, oh, it's slightly emotionally removed, you know. You, analytical. Oh, I, I would disagree. No, I would disagree with that. But, I would disagree with that. Yeah. But the pared down thing was, when people started to say it, it was a bit of a surprise. I was, I was thinking, pared down? <laughs> I think I've really gone into detail. But you know what it is? It's my journalist training and, you know, 25 years of writing as a journalist. And as a journalist, you cannot waste a word and you see repeated words and you see repeated ideas constantly. So every night now I'm writing 600 words um, and they've got to be packed full. I can't afford to, you know, because they're for the Guardian, they're for the Guardian the next to send off the next day after I've seen a show, a theatre show. Um, and that practice, and you know, remember I've been sort of, I've been worked on different parts of a newspaper, but but everything has a very short, compared to a book, a tiny word count. And you've got to make every word count. Mm. And little did I know that I was doing this here just because I'm programmed now to make every word count. And I think, you know, my editor did ask me to expand on <laughs> <laughs> said no editor ever <laughs> exactly expand certain passages and I did and then I felt a bit disgruntled I mean I think it was important that, yeah. that, but but I um that, yeah I think it was I am sort of now I think slightly hardwired to write in quite a compact way and it's it may not be for everyone because it is pared down it's sort of stripped a bit um and I, I suppose you're not conscious of the way you're writing. You, you, I, I wish I could be a little more flowery, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's backtrack slightly, I suppose, to 
uh, to your sister Fauzia's illness, um, because of course, as you sort of mentioned, it, she she sort of developed a sort of a mental illness, sort of in her late teens, would you say? It's sort of a, a point, and actually, that's again something that sort of is woven through the story as you're tr you're remembering your own relationship with her. Um, and again, it's it's sort of the interweaving of um, your relationship with each other and how that sometimes is sort of is sort of taken on that same sort of similar journey. So actually, do you want to talk a little bit about the moment that you two became really close in your teens? Because I thought that was particularly, it, it, it sort of resonated, I think it would resonate with a lot of women who have sisters, because there is that, always that moment, I think, in sisterhood, where, you, where your closeness is at its peak. Yes. Um, and it is, and it's a very sort of joyous experience. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about yeah. how you two became so close. So close. So as, as children, we were sort of, I think, divide, a little divided, because my father chose me as his favorite and she was sort of cast out a little and that became was quite um was quite visible in the family so as little children we we f i think we weren't close as sisters in a way because of that positioning but we started sharing a room it, when we were i think i was about i can't you know teens and and she was in her teens we were both in our mid-teens and um suddenly there was just this spark you know where we realized um we absolutely c loved each other we couldn't stop talking about family life the things that you know we loved the way that teenagers will with friends when they really when they sort of get a sense of themselves and their own distinct identities from you know removed from parents and family and we talked and talked um, non-stop, you know, when we shared that room. Um, it's, it's that I think we suddenly connected in a way that best, we became best friends and we connected as friends, but as sisters too. I was led by her. She was two years older than me, but just much, much more worldly and sophisticated. I was quite an introvert. I had become quite an introverted teenager, mm. whereas she was... Um, you know, more gl glamorous and beautiful. She had Saturday jobs in incredibly trendy boutique shops. She had read more, she had seen more. I was really led by um, her love of things because she told me about her love of things so compellingly, you know, from ev everything from Margaret Atwood to Renaissance art and everything that she was learning at school that struck a chord, you know, all of the Harold Pinter and Samuel Beckett. And she introduced me to things that now mean quite a lot to me yeah. you know and and so we started talking about what had happened in the family and some of her trauma and how the positioning of, of us as sisters you know me as the favorite and her not as the favorite uh, what that had done to her how that had made her feel and I hadn't quite known of the damage that it was causing my father did have a really problematic and complicated relationship with her and he made it apparent, you know, he didn't hide his favoritism and it had traumatized her and she told me about that. And I really connected with her and felt quite a shock, felt the shock of it. But beyond, you know, looking at the family as, as, as sisters sort of growing up and tearing away from it, we, um, we bonded over all the art. We started hanging out, going to cafes, going to cinemas together, you know, being fairly inseparable, analyzing everything together. Um, and also, I, you know, she, she was developing an eating disorder and, and we sort of started a binge eating together. Mm. And, and however dysfunctional that sounds, it brought us closer together. Um, so it was a shared act and you know, and while we were close, it was it was incredibly special. And then I left for university, and unfortunately, I left at the time that I think she was really um, fragile, and she'd taken an overdose. You know, she had um, she was really battling with the eating disorder. It had accelerated in a way that mine hadn't, um, and she was the the depression was really taking hold of her, and she had you know, she was a very talented artist and she had got into uh, Central St. Martin's, it's an art school, a very prestigious art, art school, but she had dropped out. And part of that was the depression, part of it was feeling she was unworthy to be there, although she was clearly talented. So life, you know, was crumbling and 
and I and I and I jetted off, you know, to university, and and I think that was the beginning of the end of our closeness. We, for for the next decade until she died, we had intensity and closeness and recognition of each other as, as you know there's so much of her that's in me and so much of me that was in her and we saw that I think and you know the way you relate to sisters you can't relate to anybody else just because they know you and I mean everything down to even physical resemblance and little mm. things that they do that you do and our voice was very similar and there all of that has a resonance and and intensity, there's nothing like, I think, a sibling intensity, particularly for me with, with a sister. Um, and we kept, we, we, we always had the love and, and, and closeness there, but then it, it became um, damaged by um, resentment, jealousy, distrust, uh, times where we weren't talking, where we were fighting and and I became more and more distant from her as well because of her depression, because I found it, you know, it was in the room. There it was taking over the room. And I felt like we couldn't be the sisters we, we had been because there was this thing that was her depression and eating disorder. And it was there whenever I talked to her, it was there. It was, it, I couldn't get beyond it. And God, you know, eat, eat, and a se severe eating disorder and severe mental health problems for the person that's suffering them is unimaginable and awful and torturous. Um, but for the person who loves that person, observing it and trying to be close and trying to relate and trying to help, but also feeling resentful, but then guilty and then despairing, it's hard too. So I'm not, you know, I'm sort of not... Um, wallowing in any element of self-pity but I'm saying being the sister that isn't upset and ill and and you know with serious mental health problems um has its own complexities and I wanted to write about that because I think there's a lot of us you know that have brothers or sisters people have um contacted me and said I have a brother who I'm incredibly close to but he is you know he's at home with my mum and dad he's with our mum, with our parents, and he's he's ill. He's got this, and I and you know I've been surprised by how people, how much people relate to mm. that sibling who is not ill, but is trying to deal with helping, but then their own anger and their own guilt. And there's a lot I think in those relationships where, as you say, you, you can you want to help there's when you are the well one there's that sort of aspect where you want to be able to i don't know solve solve the problem yeah. help the problem fix help them. them move on fix them essentially but of course you can't do that for another person especially if they're not at the point where they want to be fixed or want to fix themselves and actually one of the one of the really interesting things you do in the memoir is you sort of move very deftly between the sort of the, the young you and the now you and you're sort of questioning your memory of events and sort of reevaluating actually what was said and how it was said and what was and what was actually going on which I suppose is, is, is an example of especially with memoir is how what unreliable we all are in terms of our own recollections and especially with family situations because we will have a very a sort of certain way of viewing let's say an argument or a conversation which actually in many cases is you know, not true, or yeah. the complete opposite to the recollection of the other person involved. I, I felt I had to make that clear that this is my version, but also is my ver. You know, what is my version? Uh, I, I because um, I think my own. Never mind, you know, memory as a concept, but my own memory is unreliable. And actually, I, I read, I reread certain texts that my sister had sent me, and I'd misread them. And that became a sort of symbol for misunderstanding each other, misreading each other, maybe projecting your own fears and um, resentments onto the reality of, of family dynamics. We all sort of position, we, we're all positioned in a family, aren't we? Yeah. There's this type and there's that. And it's so difficult to move out of that that version of yourself and of course you do in the world but when you're with the family perhaps you always return to those positions to some degree whether you want to or not 
Um, but I, I think the, the bigger, um, the bigger um, question of, you know, writing a memoir and truth and whose truth and should this be written, you know, should, actually, should this be written? Do I have a right to write about a sister who can't give me her consent? Because she's... And of, and of course, your, fa your father as well, who, who, who is unable to give his version of, of events. Exactly. The, these questions became really key for me. Uh, my father's in a nursing home and he's had dementia for the past, mm. you know, nearly 15 years. And he's not in a position to even, you know, really answer my questions. I can't even, he, he doesn't, he wouldn't understand what I'm doing or what I'm asking of him. Um, so, ha so th there's a, there's a, there's a profound problem there because I am drawing a, a, a picture of family life in which my sister feels cast out by my father. Um, my mother, I, I, I my mother helped me a lot with her memories of early family life. She had a very bad marriage to my father. She gave me her version of family life. And she gave me her version, which was that my, she felt my sister was emotionally abused by my father. And some incidences I remember, and some I've just absorbed from my sister, from my sister when she told me in our, in our teen years and from my mother now, you know, more recently. And so, that's all there but at the same time i'm offering up the possibility that my father isn't this person but or, or ha has reasons that i can't understand and has an explanation of himself that i'm not giving because i can't and i've given him no right of reply because that's impossible also the versions of my the version of my sister that's emerging in this book well that's my version too just like my father is and and so i i i went i took a trip to norway actually and i went to see um monks a yeah. by edvard monk and because his sister in childhood a duck called sophie she died of, also of tb and monk had painted her repeatedly and sort of done the equivalent of this book, you know, by drawing a portrait of his sister again and again, in fact. And I wondered, I, I sat in front of a painting in which he, there was Sophie on her deathbed mm. and you could only see the back of her, but you could see all her siblings and her mother and father very clearly. And I thought that's really interesting. You know, that's a painting, not of Sophie, but of him and his grief and his family grief. And, and I think this book in some ways is about it's a portrait of me in some ways as the sister to Fazia, who's, who's, I wonder who emerges the more vivid, you know, I just, I wondered who, who this book was about, um, you know, and I quest, all those questions are sort of there, which might be infuriating to, to some people, but I did want to sort of establish this sort of uncertain, uh, uncertain ground because I, I thought about Monk's painting and I thought, you know, Monk's paintings around Sophie are are about Sophie, but really they're about himself. And the fact that he did he did them over and over. He did a sort of a series of them, so it was obviously something that he was very sort of he was consciously doing. Yeah. Yes, and I think um, I examine my sister. You know, I'm drawing paint portraits of her like that, hoping there's elements of truth and you know of her in there, hoping, but sort of offering up questions around her too, and about around the portraits too. I came across, I talked to, I talked to a lot of people f for the book, you know, that knew my sister. And one of the most amazing um, relationships I developed was with my sister's art tutor, Kelly at Camberwell College. And my sister had, after so long of being depressed, my sister had taken up embroidery and got, I started going to, uh, um, a, a group that my mother went to with sort of elderly South Asian women and my, you know, they all sat and embroidered and sewed together. And my sister had started going there and that had flared up her love of art again. And in her early forties, she'd, she'd got into Camberwell um, to do an art degree and she was doing it and Kelly was her tutor. So Kelly came to her funeral and um, kept in touch with me and, had an exhibition of my sister's work after she died. So I, I, you know, really felt indebted to Kelly and I kept in touch and actually I contacted her in Norway and I said, I've seen this painting and I'm, 
interested? You know, am I exploiting my sister's story? Am I, because there's a question of whether I feel is Monk exploiting his sister's death, the memory of, of her, her dying. And, and I did think, what right do I have? Am I exploiting this, this family story? And, and this event. And, and I sort of spoke to Kelly and Kelly likened it to artists um, and paint, um, who, who she said she'd known and read about who sketch, you know, the people they love as they're dying or yeah. on their deathbed. And she said, you know, this it needn't be for an audience. It could be for an audience, but it, it could be for yourself. And even if it is for an audience, it's what you do as an artist and you're trying to understand this this appalling you know quite surreal thing that death is by the thing that you do in the world which is draw and she she told me about an essay by john berger and which i went to and read and which really clarified this idea of who has the right to write to to, to draw portraits or to write books about whom. And in, in the essay, John Berger starts out by talking about his father's death and the moment of his death uh, and how he sketched his father's face um, when he died. And it was quite shocking to read and quite moving. And he said he, he needed to see this face. He, he needed to remember, he needed to, to draw his father's face, this moment that is going to go, you know, but this very important moment, fleeting moment in a way, where his father dies, that he needed to capture in a sketch. And then he put the sketch up on his desk wall, you know, just above his desk, he kept the sketch up. And the amazing thing he said was, um, this, this drawing changed over time. He felt that new lines were being drawn in. He saw things in it that he'd clearly done, but he hadn't noticed. And mm. he felt that it was shifting. And I thought that was such a clever way of saying so much. I mean, one of the things that that says is that your relationship with someone who's died doesn't change, uh, does, does change, keeps on changing, doesn't end after they've died. It carries on, you know, new lines keep showing themselves the, the face changes because i think your your view of that person is changing even after they've died well and at one point you sort of say that you know you're you're approaching the point where you are going to overtake her so you become you become the older sister in a lot of ways and I, that's that's always a very interesting aspect when you're when you're thinking about someone who has died that that was a really weird um moment because she died at the age of 45 mm. and I'm only two years younger well I'm two uh, two years younger than her um and I'm now for, I'm 48 but there was a very most irrational but thing that I felt it felt very real until I turned 48 which was that I wasn't going to live to 45 mm. and I you know she died when I was 43 and I fell into this fever of doing things, but also weirdly trying to tie up loose ends and bring things to a neat cloak, you know, neatening up my life, almost doing an audit of it and really keeping in mind that I had a couple of years or, you know, they were dwindling. I had a year left and, and then the sort of strangeness of life not ending at the age that hers did and then the strangeness of overtaking her age mm. while at the same time knowing she'll always be my older sister yeah which is which is a, a weird notion but she will always be my older sister of course mm. she will of course she Even will I'm, I'm you know four years older than her now um, it's what happens. I think you, you sort of do strange that yeah, it's it those are interesting ideas that I felt brought me sort of a kind of lightness, you know, that they were um revelations that I made during this book, that it's not all dark and grief and miserable, that there's richness there that gets you to think about love and family and you know, the surrealness of death. 
while you were talking and I was thinking one of the things I think in recent times maybe we've done quite badly is how we talk and think about grief and loss and actually when you were sort of saying about you know uh, about having death masks and people drawing you know that their dead loved ones in those moments and spending time with the body and that's something that actually in recent times has completely has been sort of taken out of our sort of culture especially sort of western culture i would say and i want i wondered while i was reading your book whether this sort of this sort of I don't want to say a, a sort of a, a boom of memoirs that deal with grief, but a lot of it I think is about artists wanting us to think about this again and wanting us not to sort of you know shove death into a corner and sort of yeah I don't know, I don't know. did you did you, did you see what I mean I think it's whether artists are trying to draw us back to actually looking at, at death in a in a better way almost. Yeah, and, 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 and maybe making that point, which we all sort of know anyway, that death is a part of, a, of life. It's a, it's a valid part of life. It's there. So um, why turn your face away from it? I, I, I think you're right that the, a de the, death mem the rise of the death memoir is partly that. And there's a whole movement, you know, with death cafes and talk, you know, people convening to talk about death and bereavement and mourning and sharing their experiences and turning into something that's not taboo or to be hushed, hushed up. Um, so, so, but, but now we've got the complications of, um, well, the sort of complications of COVID where there's been so much death that mm. I think people can relate and, and are drawn to talking about that because it's such a massive collective, collective experience. It's, I know what I noticed about grief was that it was so solitary and so lonely. You know, you're walking around the world and the world's getting on with being busy. Mm. And actually you feel like you, you've got this immense sadness that nobody else can relate to. But, you know, we've had COVID, we've had enormous amount of loss. So I think perhaps people are talking about it, but then Oh, and, and doctors being better at talking because one of the most appalling things I, I um, experienced was the, the inadequacies and actually the coldness I felt of doctors not, not speaking about death. And I was shocked, shocked beyond belief because they're surrounded by death and yet they can't, you know, they, they didn't know how to talk about it and they were quite cruel. I felt there was quite a lot of cruel in, in, instances where I felt... Um, they were not just inadequate, but actually sort of inappropriate. So, so all of that, I think, um, hospitals and doctors have had to get better at quite quickly because of what we've experienced. But at the same time, in terms of you know our relationship to the dead, we've had to we've had to keep a distance. Mm. It's, a, it's again become a remote experience where people are dying away from us. Away and when... from us, and only five people or whatever are allowed at a funeral, and that you know so, so it's frustrating in a way because I think there has been a movement where people have said look you know that there, there are nations and cultures that know how to embrace and um and look death in the face and and actually explore it and not be scared of it I mean um the culture that I th the, the friend one you know there were a few friends that I really related to and one has experienced a lot of death and, and she was there and and wasn't scared to talk and and listen and another who also has experienced a lot of death but she's she's Irish and she knew exactly what to say and do because she'd grown up in a culture where you have open coffins where you have wakes where funerals are big sociable things mm -hmm. where you don't shut death away in a box and once you know, some the funeral's over, just pretend that person, you know, has gone on a very, very permanent trip and must, you know, we must never now talk about the actual death. Um, so there's this great big part missing, you know, from our culture that we don't um, sit down and talk and actually help each other through grief because, you know, grief, grief kind of comes in waves, but, but it's all the more scary and alarming when you're not being allowed to talk about it it feels really furtive it feels like a great weight and I, luckily I found people that I could talk to about it luckily I'm from a family who are from a culture where death is a physical event you know and it's it's 
a matter of you know you, that the person who's died um their body is to be cherished and, and you wash the body which is what i did and you see it and there's nothing to be fearful of it's, it's what I, I have talked to friends who've said well i i don't wish to do that um you know, I've no, I know a friend who said, well, when her mother died, she didn't, she was, she was invited to look at her mother and she didn't want to do that because that's not who her mother was in her lifetime. So I think we're allowed to have these opinions. We're allowed to um, turn away and not look at death if we don't want to, but, but I think it shouldn't be the taboo that it is. Um, and it's complicated right now by what we're going through, you know, the immense grief, but also the removal, being removed from the physical event. Uh, I guess not being able to participate in it in, in, yeah. in sort of any sort of ritual fashion. Yeah. Um, changing tack slightly, but one of the beautiful aspects of the book is your inclusion of uh, Fawzia's art in it. And it's sort of apparent, and actually people won't be able to see from the cover, but actually you've got sort of embroidery um, yes. actually on the yeah. cover yeah. Uh, in sort of embossed on it but then surprisingly when I when I noticed that there were sort of photos or pictures included in the book of course my assumption was oh these are going to be sort of family photos you know snapshots you know first houses first and it and it was really quite surprising but also really um I don't know it, it felt very moving to look at her art and to be given the opportunity to sort of see her I suppose in the way that you saw her and that her teachers had seen her through what she created so do you want to talk a little bit about sort of yeah. her, her finding her art and, and and sort of in choosing to include it yeah um because when she died after she died we had she lived in a housing association flat a tiny little flat and we only had 30 days to clear it out so there was a you know, we were, had to get in there and it was very traumatic uh, to put her things away in a way, mm. give a lot of things away. But what was um, just joyous was that her art em emerged from everywhere, like every nook and corner and cupboard <laughs> had this gorgeous artwork. And so much of it was really complicated, intricate, stunning mm. embroidery. I mean, I don't know how many hours and weeks and months it had taken to complete some of these intricate things. And, and there, was, there were paintings, there were sketchbooks, you know, there was, they, they just kept turning up. And we shared them amongst us and I put them away um, because it was just a little too much to look through them because that was another way of investigating my sister and her inner life. And I was, um, exhausted by by the grief and maybe I was keeping it to a point where it wasn't just all darkness where I could look at her work and actually explore it and see some of the joy in it and the yeah. beauty and the ideas and the anger you know and what she was trying to say through it she had a lot to say through her art so perhaps I was keeping it for a better moment and I did open it up for writing this book a few years after her death and I did find parts of her that I hadn't that I'd misunderstood, that I hadn't seen clearly in life, in, in her lifetime. Um, but I just saw how important, you know, beauty was to her as well, because there was so much beauty and color and sheen, you know, there was a lot of glitter. She uses these amazing threads. She uses a lot of sequins and it's very tactile, like the book cover is. Mm -hmm. And um, when the ed, it was actually, my editor who said, oh, and we must include her artwork. I was, I couldn't, I, I was so moved by it. And um, I thought, what a lovely thing, because it sort of means that this book, you know, for all the questions about whose book is it, what's the intention behind writing it, mm -hmm. um, it sort of becomes both our stories in a way. There's her art sort of declaring itself and, and, and there, you know, it can be, it, it's a bit of her that's parts of her there in, in the book which I thought was a brilliant idea and I I didn't want family pictures in there I decided I know that it's probably um you know more conventional to have portraits in there the first house us as children I didn't yeah. want it to be that kind of book I wanted the the words to say to, to draw those pictures and then I wanted the reader to carry them around as characters you know as you would with any book I felt it would be a really odd thing to do also because 
my family's quite a private family. So to have them, this is my endeavor, this book, it's my version of my family and my sister, but to have them, their pictures in there. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't think my, my dad's not in the state to object. And I don't think, I think my mom, mother wouldn't have objected. My brother's very private and he, he would, but maybe he would have gone along with it. But I sort of felt it wasn't appropriate to have the entire family pictured in there. I've just spent, you know, a year writing and drawing the family. That's what I've been doing. So I hope, um, I bet, you know, the, right, the reader might want to see pictures, but I hope the embroidery says, says more about her and makes the statement that this book is about this, you know, the art. Well, well that's it. it. For me, it just, it, it really sort of brought it home that it is about the art and it, um, not just the art that she taught, sort of showed you and taught you and, and made you love, but also about the own art that she created and some of the embroidery. I just wish that I could see it in real life because they are just beautiful. And I can imagine people coming up to you all the time while you talk about, again, about the book, about, you know, whether or not you would actually want to sell some of it. Because again, <laughs> it's, they are, they are beautiful. The series of the, the nudes and cats, the I nudes. think is, which is in the book. So anyone yeah. watching this, it's, they're beautiful and they, they would make, well, they would adorn many a wall quite happily. Yeah, they're so cute and they're so mischievous that's it there's and like you say there's so much joy in them but they're just they're just really they just come up they're really beautiful items um so it's unbelievably decorative but again and you talk a little bit about this about the sort of uh, her sort of own reluctance to embrace embroidery as her form yeah. of art because of the connotations around you know embroidery being of course female for certain types of women all that kind of thing and I, but I, thing, yeah but yeah. again, she does them in such a unique and sort of very sort of sort of her personality just seems to shine through them, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. Oh. They're really beautiful. I, I I thought it was really generous of you to share them with us actually. Oh, I'm so pleased you've you've responded that way because I think they're amazing. They're amazing in real life because you can sort of feel them and <laughs> it's amazing to see thread doing stuff that in a way I've seen in paintings. I can't quite decide is this is a painting, is this an embroidery? Because she's done it quite cleverly and sometimes she mixes the two. You know, she'll do an oil painting but put stitching on and you know, collages with so it's all sort of slightly multimedia. Um the, the art is is the it is the most joyous thing, you know, and it's also physical things that, um, that, that are there in the world of my sister. And um, yeah, there is a bit of a question about what I do with them. Do I keep them in, you know, sort of pristine archived boxes and folders and her portfolio, you know, put away because there's only so much space on my wall or do I sort of send them out in the world that uh, as art, you know, should be sent out in the world and be looked at and, and um, admired and enjoyed. So, so now I've got this dilemma around the art because people have seen it. And as you say, you know, they see it in the book and they think, oh, well, I'd love this piece or are they for sale? So I kind of still working through what am I going to do with this gorgeous archive of, yeah, do I, do I keep it all for myself? Do I give it to fre um, friends and family? Or do I sell it? So that's the next sort of, uns you know, unsolved question right now. Well, it made me think of all the art that you had gone to see in your sort of quest to sort of to write this book. And I sort of and I sort of thought, well, well hang on a second. If, 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 if someone had, had hidden this away and they weren't yeah. able to see it, you know, you wouldn't have been able to, to no. think and write about it. So that was, right. and that's where I was coming from. I was thinking how wonderful it would be to, to come across these and yeah. not and not to know anything about them other than these are beautiful pieces of art. And I suppose that's where, yeah, it, it, that's where I, I came to with it. And that you make a good point because once it's out there, like her art is out there, and once the book is out there, you know, it becomes your story. You know, Monk's painting became something that I related to and I saw my sister in, and I saw myself in. Um, and Keats's life and death and, and work became something that, you know, in a way I, I could own. And I think that's the, that's the thing with writing a family memoir. You know, it's once, once it's written, other people own it and other people make their own decisions about both my sister as the artist, as the, as the ill sister and me as the well sister. And I guess, yeah, it's out there. So there's something, that, there's interesting things there that, that you know, to, 
to push her artwork out there it becomes its own thing and maybe removed from her um, eating disorder and her illness and it just becomes you know this a series of naked women who love you know having the look of this imaginary spectator and are smiling and, and like being admired and you know they become their own thing they take on their own life yeah well i think that's probably an excellent place to end this conversation there are so many other parts of the book that we could have talked about and i'm sure you'll be discussing your memoir with lots of people for years to come to be honest as, as more and more people read it and you should read it so um, I would just like to say uh, thank you so much for joining me in this conversation it's been lovely talking to you and for everyone watching if you would like to buy a copy of uh, Arifa Akbar's Consumed A Sister Story it's published by Scepter and there will be links sort of in the usual places for you to buy from our partners at Waterstones but of course you know, joyfully, all bookshops are now open. So please do visit your local bookshop and buy a, a copy and buy a copy for those people in your life who are art lovers or have sisters or have families or just enjoy reading good books. Um, thank you all for watching and thank you most of all to you, Arifa Akbar. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>